Okay. Welcome everybody um, to our Sunday afternoon program. Um, I'm thrilled to have all of you here and I know that Shannon is really excited as well. Uh, so I'm just going to once again say um, welcome. Uh, my name is Sarah Cauley. I'm the executive director of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. I know that we do have a lot of members on today's call, but I also know that we have some non-members. So if anybody wants to talk about how to support the foundation later on after this, please give me a call um, or send me an email. Um, thank you again, uh, Shannon, for taking your time and reaching out to me to put this on. Um, I am excited. So I do want to just read our land acknowledgement. We gratefully acknowledge Native peoples who have lived on this land for millennia. Their dedication to the land and their communities runs deep within the hearts of those past, present, and future. This dedication encourages the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation to continue developing among diverse communities, an understanding of and an appreciation for the commitment of Native peoples to this nation and the significance of the Lewis and Clark expedition. With that, I do just want to introduce Shannon for just a moment. So Shannon is a lifelong or a lifetime member of LCTHF. Um, she has been with us for many years and she is uh, very involved in the foundation in various ways. She is now the lead interpreter at the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center and Fort Mandan State Historic Site. Um, and this whole presentation that she is giving to us today will also um, be written up in, uh, in We Proceeded On. So stay tuned for that, folks. And with that, I'm going to um, just turn it over to Shannon. So uh, it's all yours now. Hey, everyone. And fun thing, as of January 1st, I am now the interpretive resource specialist at my site. What does that mean? Well, besides all kinds of insurance technicalities. It means I'm also involved with artifacts and replica items. And since I'm up here by Fort Mandan, I'm sitting on the ancestral homeland of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara peoples, as well as kind of the convergent homelands of the Lakota and Dakota peoples. And a lot of where we are going to be exploring in this presentation, kind of a lot of different people's homes at different times, including the Osage people, Missouri, Odo, Sac or Sock and Fox, the Shawnee and others. Today, there are no Native American reservations within the state of Missouri, very much in part of events that take place during the time period of this presentation and shortly afterwards and involving individuals that you'll see, including William Clark's involvement. I'm gonna share my screen. me get to sharing my screen. Technology. Okay. All right, it's go time. So a lot of us, let's be honest, when we think about Frederick Bates, if we know he even exists, it's as Meriwether Lewis's basically post-expedition nemesis. And this title, the little animal I had mistaken as my friend, judging from the spelling, you can probably guess that's not a Meriwether Lewis quote. That is a William Clark quote, and we'll see how that shows up later. That doesn't sound like something Clark would say, or maybe if you know Clark, you know, it would be something he'd say. Now, how did I end up deciding I wanted to do a presentation or research Frederick Bates? Well, what started out as a rabbit hole of looking more at Lewis's governorship turned into a rabbit hole of learning about Frederick Bates. Except this wasn't a rabbit hole like Alice in Wonderland. This started to become more like watership down rabbit holes, a little more intense. So Frederick Bates, he has beginnings not unlike Lewis or Clark or many of the others. 
He's from Goochland County, Virginia, which if you see my cursor, it's right about there. Two counties to the east of Albemarle County. Goochland County was home to people like some of Jefferson's family members. And Frederick was born June 23rd, 1777. He's the fourth of 12 children, third of seven brothers. Parents are Thomas Fleming Bates and Carolyn Matilda Woodson Bates. And they are Quakers, but they're Southern Quakers, kind of in the same vein as people like Dolly Madison's kind of birth, her family and her first marriage before James Madison. They're Quakers with contradictions. They own slaves, they enslave people, and that they view it as somewhat of an evil. By this point in time, the rest of Quakers, especially in the North, have said do not own slaves nonetheless people in the south are but they kind of treat it as well we quote treat our people better which they did you could say treat their enslaved household members better in some cases but nonetheless those are people who don't have any choice in what happens to their lives and their families another contradiction quakers are supposed to be pacifists However, Thomas Fleming Bates, the father, fought in the American Revolution and also contributed a lot of his own finances, resources, which very much cost the family material-wise and somewhat in community reputation. During both the American Revolution and the War of 1812 later on, Southern Quakers especially get put in a hard place because you don't want to not be patriotic, but you also don't want to be shunned by your community. Thomas Fleming Bates was at Yorktown for Cornwallis's surrender, but all of this leaves the Bates family in debt. They're very much in genteel poverty. So the older brothers of that, of the 12 kids, they can't afford to go to college and do a lot of the things that their peers got to. For example, Frederick hoped to pursue a career in law. And while their father highly valued education because they're Quakers, literacy is important, but also their father knew education would be their only way out of their financial situation. So while many of Frederick's peers who went to pursue law in Virginia got to go to William and Mary, Frederick has to do it kind of the hard way. So when he's 16 years old in the 1790s, he enters law by apprenticing with a county court clerk right there in Goochland County. And you had to be self-reliant. So pretty much everything he made, that was his money. Not nearly as glamorous as getting to go to William and Mary and meet the who's who of Virginia politics and party it up as Jefferson himself reminisced of his time at, in Williamsburg. And because of those dynamics, the older Bates brothers very much have an enormous chip on their shoulders for the rest of their lives. They have to work hard for everything, but they still have memories, even slight, of when their family had stability, especially because their families, both the Bates, the Woodsons, the Flemings, very much in those top tiers of Virginia gentry. The younger brothers, as well as the sisters, they pretty much end up appreciating anything that happens to them. So as we'll see later on, the different generations of this set of siblings have very different circumstances and react to those differently. So once he's done with his kind of law apprenticeship, young Frederick leaves. He receives a commission to work in the Northwest Territories courts. And he leaves alone on horseback with whatever he could pack. Many of us may remember when we're in our late teens, early 20s, that first time we have to leave home. Well, as many in their family would later laugh about, Frederick Bates apparently looked very young for his age. He was baby-faced. So when he leaves, he stayed only a few nights into his journey. He stays at an inn, and the innkeeper thinks, this is a runaway child. He refers to him as a stripling. And Frederick later tells his family that he took out his set of pistols 
along with his commission for the in the Northwest Territory Corps saying, I am in fact an, an adult and I have a job waiting for me and I'm a gentleman, even if I look like a baby. So interesting start for this young man. Once he makes it up there to Detroit, which in this era is only a couple hundred people, it's been occupied by the French, the British, the Americans are there, and he gets involved with law. He will study law as he's working as a low-level person in the courts. He's also involved with different business ventures, and he's quickly employed as a civilian by the region's Army Quartermaster Department. And there's a lot of isolation he feels. He writes many letters home to his brothers and to his sisters, just discussing how he's so far away from home. And when he does hear from family, it's about marriages, births, deaths, sometimes births followed by deaths, that he wants to hear more, he wants more books to read. And from these early letters, you get the sense of the messy dynamics going on between these siblings. I remember in a presentation a few months ago by Jim Holmberg on the relationship between William Clark and his brothers, that they pretty much, the brothers had a pretty good solid relationship. They disagree about things, but they'd still be civil, still remain in contact. The Bates brothers, especially with the older half of them, it's a little different. They will go for periods years with refusing to speak to each other or write to each other after getting into a feud. Frederick and Richard go through quite a few years of that, but eventually they'll be close confidants again. The siblings who Frederick has the best relationship in this era are Tarleton, so his older brother Tarleton Bates, as well as his sisters, especially his favorite sister, Sally. And some of his letters to Sally are Pretty fun. New Year's 1799, you can see that quote. I do not often get beastly drunk and often restrain my conduct. He also tells Sally as well as Tarleton about how the French ladies in Detroit, they pretty much put him in an awkward spot. This is where you can start to see Frederick Bates is an awkward individual, which might sound familiar, sound like another person we're gonna meet in this, but Frederick complains about how the French girls will go up to him, say at a ball, and act like they can't understand English and only speak French. But well, you can tell they know, they understand his English. And he complains that they don't have any sense of modesty. But then on the other hand, Frederick Bates admits that the French people of Michigan have a lot of good in them, that they're hardworking and respectable, regardless of what their social status is. Carlton and him will exchange letters about dreams. So to us, it seems a little strange, but keep in mind, Benjamin Rush was a big proponent of writing down your dreams and writing about that in letters to your friends and family. So we get things that we don't even have from Meriwether Lewis or William Clark. Letters that Frederick wrote to Tarleton talking about being consumed by kind of a storm monster coming off the Great Lakes. There's another one that he wrote to Tarleton about where he had a nightmare where he was in hand, like face-to-face -face combat or a duel with Richard, their other brother. Tarleton is also writing back to him, keeping him informed on affairs in the army. Things are happening in Europe with Napoleon and getting him involved in politics. Frederick had started out as a Federalist, but pretty early on, he figures out that as a somewhat penniless individual from Virginia, he, the Federalist world has no space for him versus Tarleton, who is a very intense, staunch Democratic Republican. During Frederick's time in Detroit, he gets visits from his brother because Tarleton is in the army. They're spending a lot of time in Michigan and at Detroit, kind of monitoring Native American activity, also monitoring a lot of the British around the lakes who still have forts illegally. And with his brother, so this is a painting of Detroit from 1804, gives you an idea. 
a little different from today. So to the right, you have Tarleton, two years older than him. Oftentimes his friend with him, the one and only Meriwether Lewis. What's interesting to me is that this is probably some of the first times Lewis had ever met Frederick. And at this point, it seems like they get along. Tarleton is one of Meriwether Lewis's closest friends before the expedition. And to me, it seems very interesting that these two would be such good friends because Tarleton, by all accounts, was pretty outgoing, pretty bold. And Meriwether, Lewis is a little bit like his little, like Tarleton's little brother, Frederick. On the quiet side, introverted, but once he's in the right conversation, we'll tell you all about it. But kind of moody, but intellectual. So, kind of an interesting little precursor. Now, in the time that Mr. Bates is up there, in Michigan, what's now Michigan, the map is changing rapidly. So in 1802, you see things change. Northwest Territory, that kind of peninsula, the mitten has been split in half. Northwest Territory is over here. Indiana has been created, Indiana Territory. And then in 1803, Ohio becomes a state, Indiana Territory gets the entire mitten of Michigan. And of course, in 1803, Louisiana is purchased from France by taking it back from Spain after holding on to it for a while. So during all this change, what a time to be alive, young Frederick Bates is networking and getting more experience under his belt. In 1802, he became Detroit's postmaster. And keep in mind, all these things are being piled on top of each, on top of each other. As we'll see with the Louisiana Territory as well, it was pretty common for a territory official to wear way more hats than a state official would wear today at the same time. In 1804, the Detroit Land Office hired Bates as their receiver of monies and land commissioner which will set him on a traje trajectory to be highly involved with Louisiana purchases, kind of dispersal and, of lands and verification of titles. Now that he's making more money, Frederick is able to study law on the side a lot more and even opens his very own mercantile business. He also will issue loans and gets the reputation somewhat of a loan shark. Bates will get your money one way or another. He doesn't mess around. And he doesn't tolerate debtors very well. In 1805, his portion of what was the Northwest Territory became Michigan Territory. So the mitten is now a territory. And he's appointed a territorial judge by Jefferson. And that commission was sent by James Madison, Secretary of State himself. And Frederick Bates felt extremely honored and his response is interesting because he essentially says, I'm afraid that I may not be perfect at this, but I'm going to try, which is for early young Frederick Bates, that's pretty typical. So he ends up in the circle of Governor William Hull, a respected Revolutionary War veteran, and becomes very close to William Hull's daughter, Anne to the point where even though they aren't quite in an official courtship, it's pretty obvious to everyone and a lot of their letters survive, including ones that Anne wrote in code to Frederick. Frederick Bates also becomes kind of a protege for Judge George, for Judge Lucas. Each time I say it, I feel like I'm gonna say George Lucas with an accent, but Mr. Lucas is originally from France. He had been kind of taken under Benjamin Franklin's wing and eventually comes to the United States. He's from a somewhat noble family in France, but 
doesn't have a lot of money to his name. So for Frederick, he has he finds a lot in common with him. Someone who's from a respectable family, but has the background, the education, but has to scrape his own way up. Another important influence is that Lucas is someone who makes no exceptions. He is a hardliner for any and all rules. And that is something you will see with Frederick Bates. He doesn't adapt quite as easily. So for Frederick Bates, being in Michigan influences a lot of who he's going to become. Now, I'm going to jump back a little bit. 1803, there's a great letter from Tarleton to Frederick. Tarleton is living in Pittsburgh by this point in time. And who should be hanging out in Pittsburgh in much of the summer of 1803? But Meriwether Lewis putting together his expedition. Now, there are no hard feelings between Tarleton and Lewis. But keep in mind, before all of this, Lewis had been appointed Thomas Jefferson's private secretary. Tarleton and Frederick's father had hoped that they would, one of them would receive that appointment, but Lewis gets the commission and delivered to him by none other than Tarleton. So many historians have said that perhaps Frederick's later animosity towards Lewis would be stemming from that. Interestingly, no one from the Bates family ever mentions that. So in October 1803, Tarleton's been hanging out with Lewis in Pittsburgh, helping him put some stuff together for the expedition. And he reported to Frederick some intel on what's going on with the expedition leadership. He mentions Connor never had it in his offer, the situation of companion and guide to Captain Lewis. And he reports Captain Clark of Louisville goes in the former capacity, had the first offer and the only one, except to Hook conditionally, which would be Mo Lieutenant Moses Hook, who had been Lewis's second option, his plan B. Now Tarleton tells Frederick, as to the guide, Mr. Lewis, engaging the interpreter from your territory, it may be Connor. I know little of your becoming a separate government. Lewis had not heard of it. So Frederick's information to Tarleton telling him about Ohio statehood was enough ahead of the game that even Lewis did not know about the statehood until then. And this is an image of that letter from the Missouri Historical Society. So once again, that rapidly changing map, as you can see, Michigan territory is its own territory. It's a mitten. The UP is still a part of Indiana territory. There's a lot of hardships that happen to Frederick in the next few years while that expedition is out west. Detroit has a massive fire in the summer of 1805 that consumes the entire town and all citizens are expected to help put out fires. Frederick was one of those who helped fight fires, but he lost essentially all of the merchandise from his business. Pretty soon after, there started to be plans to re-lay out Detroit. Frederick was left out of that. And he continues to get bad news about his family's financial situation and the social hardship back home. As you can imagine, in a family with lots of financial problems and they continually discover debts, there are lots of arguments, fights. His sisters are put in a very hard spot. Think about in this time period, there are women who, if it weren't for their family situation, would be very eligible. However, they don't even have dowries. And as Frederick writes to Sally, he feels horrible for her because, as he puts it, she has seen wretched scenes. 
she is the one who has to watch what's happening along with the other sisters and they are the ones that unlike the brothers they can't go out and start their own career it would be impolite for women of their status to go and start careers but on the other hand they can't be as picky about husbands because they have almost no dowry Things are getting a little harder to at home beyond just money. Their father, Thomas Bates, passed away at age 63 in 1805 after an illness. And Frederick's beloved sister, Sally, was struck dead by lightning in that same summer. But things aren't gonna get better just yet. Tarleton is his closest brother but he's also outspoken, maybe too outspoken. He, he prided himself on his democratic Republican values. So that's a lot like Lewis. And he's a contributor to the Tree of Liberty, which is a democratic Republican publication. And they have a rivalry with the Federalist publication, the Commonwealth. After the Democrat Republicans saw successes across Pennsylvania in their 1805 elections, the Commonwealth referred to Tarleton, Bates, and another Tree of Liberty writer, Henry Baldwin, as two of the most abandoned political miscreants that ever disgraced a state. So Tarleton responded by finding the writer responsible for that comment and attacking him with a whip in person. So the equivalent of that today would be imagine having, say, like CNN and Fox News, not just reporters, but like the higher ups find each other and attack each other. That's what's going on. But in this era in the early republic, politics can get very personal very fast. Also think about the nature of attacking someone with a whip. In 1806 America, what people are usually at the end of a whip? enslaved African-Americans. So to attack someone with a whip in this era is to essentially say, I see you on par with enslaved and with livestock, with animals. So that's, an, that's gonna get you into a huge affair of honor. And sure enough, going from whipping Ephraim Pentland goes to everyone issuing challenges, and after an escalating chain of events, Thomas Stewart issues a challenge to Tarleton Bates. He accepts and he's killed at age 28 in Pennsylvania's last duel. So that's January 8th, 1806. Frederick doesn't find out for a few weeks, few months, and when he learns, he's devastated because for him, Tarleton is really the only brother from his age of his siblings that he never had any serious issues with. The brother who, even if they had slight arguments, never shut him off. He's the brother who listened to all kinds of information from him. And Tarleton would spill out his own heart to Frederick. So there's a lot for Frederick. Things can only go up from here. Towards the end of 1806, he travels back to Virginia to see family, says bye to Anne Hull and others. And pretty soon, news of the expedition's return, Lewis and Clark, spreads throughout the country. Interestingly, Frederick Bates was present at the January 14th, 1807 banquet that had been held in the captain's honor in Washington. And that's the one where Joel Barlow honored Mary with a Lewis with his uh, Columbia, kind of a sequel to his The Vision of Columbus. And at this point, Joel Barlow was kind of the most celebrated poet in America, the most celebrated homegrown poet of the time. And it's interesting that Bates would be there for that moment, because we've many of us have seen the quote from him in 1809 when he complains to his brother Richard and he says that Lewis had been spoiled by the elegant praises of Mitchell 
Samuel Mitchell and Barlow. Also, I think it's fascinating later on when Frederick Bates compiled his own personal library at his future home, Thornhill in Missouri. He has a copy of the vision of Columbus, but he doesn't have the Columbiad. If anyone ever gave a copy to him, he probably threw it into a fire. So I think it's so fascinating that we get that quote from Bates of saying he's Lewis has been spoiled, he's a celebrity. And he was there at that dinner with all these people writing, reading their poems and celebrating Lewis. Now, what's interesting is we wonder, when did things get bad between the two men? Well, it's definitely not right away. Frederick is appointed pretty early on in 1807 to be secretary of Louisiana Territory, or Upper Louisiana, both phrases are used. And he's also the head of the land board there. Part of his job is going to be clearing out the land titles. They're having to clarify titles that were filed under the French system, pre-Napoleonic, essentially Roman law, stuff filed when the Spanish were occupying, and there's this gap after the Treaty of San Ildefonso, which transfers Louisiana back to France from Spain, the period between that and 1803, where there's this gap on what land titles are legitimate and which are not. So Frederick and the land board end up will for years be having to clean up that mess. And he is going to inherit a mess that was made worse by General James Wilkinson. Meriwether Lewis, as one of his rewards for the expedition, he's appointed governor of that territory. And it's not clear, Bates was likely appointed because of his good record in Michigan, in the courts, as well as land clerking. But also, Lewis may very well have told Jefferson, oh, I heard that poor Tarleton died in a duel, fighting the good fight for politics. His little brother, Frederick's pretty smart. And initially, things start out well. Now in 1809, Frederick will write to his brother that Lewis had made all kinds of promises of a good relationship and goes, well, what was that about? And the what Lewis does write to him is inviting him while they're both still in Virginia to come meet up with him. Not otherwise engage. I shall expect your expect you to take tea with me this evening. There are several subjects on which I wish to converse with you. And notice how Mr. Lewis signs this letter your friend and obedient servant. Lewis doesn't call people his friend very often. You have to really gain his loyalty. So the fact that this is how things start out and the way things end between the two is such a stark difference. That alone is almost a doable offense in this time period. Now, Frederick almost immediately sets out for St. Louis, the capital of the territory. Clark goes out there and then comes back east for his wedding to Julia Hancock. Lewis doesn't show up till spring 1808. Now, when Frederick Bates gets to St. Louis, he's jumping on a lot of opportunities. He purchases the land grants of George Drewyer, John Collins, and Joseph Whitehouse all expedition veterans. And I don't have it on this slide. My slides are all somewhat irregular, but the way Bates spells Drewyard is essentially Druzelard. So the poor man never had his last name ever spelled correctly by anyone. That's his life curse. So just from purchasing those three men's land grants from the expedition, Frederick Bates has already acquired 960 acres of land in the territory. Land requirements for territorial officials included 1,000 acres for governor. 
And land speculation was technically forbidden for Quakers, but just like slavery and fighting in the Revolutionary War, those are things you can easily ignore. So Frederick Bates who gets involved in land speculation, quickly acquires quite a lot of land. A lot of that is in the area that they refer to as Von Home. Von Home, that's now very much near what's now Chesterfield, Missouri. And he will reside for much of his first few years in Louisiana, in St. Louis, renting from Pierre Shoto. And he will start cultivating the land uh, on some of his property, initially with tenant farmers, and then eventually enslaved an enslaved family. Frederick Bates also gets involved with the well-being of George Shannon. In 1807, the expedition that was supposed to return Sheheke Sho and his family, the Mandan leader, to his home up here in North Dakota was turned back by the Arikara and the encounter became violent and George Shannon, who had been the youngest member of the Lewis and Clark expedition was shot in the leg and his leg had to be amputated. Clark was able to be in St. Louis to help for a little bit but he goes back east for his wedding. But he, along with his brother-in-law, Dennis Fitzhugh, stayed in touch with Frederick Bates to make sure that George Shannon as well as George Gibson, another expedition veteran who'd been injured, are cared for in St. Louis, and also making sure that money from Indian affairs budgets can be used to keep these men keep these men cared for. And Bates mentions it has been impossible to avoid making some advances prior to the final adjustment of several of the accounts particularly to the unfortunate Shannon, whose life was for a time despaired of, but who is now since the amputation of his leg on the recovery. So he's very attentive for the welfare of George Shannon. Gibson's out pretty early, Shannon loses his leg and for years has to work to hold on to a pension, but Bates very much believes George Shannon deserves to be cared for. When Clark and Julia eventually show up, they will also kind of take George Shannon under their wing. Mary with a Lewis also very much does. And once Shannon's able to walk around on a wooden kind of artificial leg, Shannon and Lewis will go and examine lead mine properties. Now things aren't so great for Frederick Bates though, immediately showing up in the territory. He's already annoyed that he's there ahead of people like Lewis. Well, he's also hearing from Anne. May 12th, 1807, my birthday, quite a few hundred years before I'm alive. Anne Hole writes to Bates from Detroit. I had determined not to write you until you convinced me my letters gave you pleasure. And she starts out with well wishes from all his friends in Detroit saying, don't forget us, don't become someone else. But then it takes a whole new turn. She tells him, some say you have married. Please describe her. Dear friend, find some reason to return. No situation would be unpleasant to me were I but with you. So that's some pretty big stuff to drop. And Frederick is stuck in St. Louis. What can he do? And everyone back home is in Virginia and back in Detroit is asking, so are you going to propose to her or have you married someone else? Well, as Frederick soon after writes, to his sister Anna, aka Nancy. There's a lot of Anns and Nancys in this story, just a warning. He says, you inquire after, cryptically referring to Ann. Oh, she has forsaken me. My hopes there are forever blasted. She wrote me two letters. The first was very cold and the latter closed the correspondence. A friend from Detroit wrote me several months ago that she was about to be married to another. Anne Hole marries a random army soldier named Harris Hampton Hickman. And as one of Frederick's mutual friends in Detroit wrote, we all were pretty shocked. They were, everyone was shocked. People didn't know why this was happening. And Frederick, his hopes are pretty much destroyed.
But Frederick eventually opens up to how maybe some of this is his own fault. Flipping through my notes, I can give you the quote. So once again, this is things where we get more from Frederick Bates from his record than we have from Lewis or Clark. He's responding to Anthony Ernest saying, are you sure her present husband loves her? Not how miserable for her and how you would regret not having married her. Always great news to, you know, words to send to someone whose former interest just married someone else. But Bates tells Anthony Ernest, in truth, I never loved her as perhaps I ought. And her attachment to me was of the temperate kind, by no means allied to madness, a simple esteem. It did not come up to my ideas of the passion nor absorb as I should require every other consideration. So Frederick Bates was expecting a marriage based on love, of course, to someone of the proper social status, like a governor's daughter. And he didn't, take things as quickly as he did in his relationship with Anne because he didn't feel they were to his level of passion. But once, of course, she gets married, he realizes, oh, I guess I lost my chance. Does it sound like another person we know? Well, he doesn't have a lot of options that he likes in St. Louis. Caroline Matilda, his sister, at this point, she's married into the Gamble family of Virginia, writes to her brother on February 28th, 1808. I can see very well that the ladies of Louisiana are far from what you would want. Some Virginians, Mrs. Anthony, might serve to civilize them. Women who look upon themselves as a piece of furniture are my utter aversion, too contemptible to go under the denomination of a woman. So, Similar to many Americans, especially Virginians who moved to St. Louis, they don't always have great things to say about French, Creole, French Canadian, you could say, society. Some of that is an anti-Catholic bias. Some of that is just a difference in what they expect. Keep in mind that for the Bateses, they are Quakers, so the women are very well educated and outspoken. So for Caroline, she knows her brother well enough to know you want someone who maybe has a spine, who is educated and literate and knows poetry like you do. Frederick loved poetry. His other sister, Anna, also commented that while her brother needs someone who has a spine, essentially, that as she put it, these free-spirited fillies, that's her phrase, probably wouldn't be a good fit for him either. So he need, he wants someone who will provide him with total love and passion, but is mature, but isn't too wild, but also happens to have money. So we're getting an idea. Some of these guys are just expecting things that maybe they can't even provide themselves. In the meantime, more news between Frederick Bates and the enlisted men of the expedition are going, going on. He acts as a scribe for some of the veterans who are petitioning Congress to have their land grants located where they would like. So individuals involved include Patrick Gass, George Gibson, Silas Goodrich, Hugh Hall, Joseph and Reuben Field, John B. Thompson, and Alexander Willard. And Text, many of your petitioners are poor and earnestly solicit that whatever price their country may set upon their toilsome and perilous services may not be withheld from them. Your petitioners would beg leave to represent that many of them have married since their return and are generally residents of the territory of Louisiana or Indiana, where they have settled themselves. Not doubting, but that it would be found equally expedient to lay off their lands within limits of one of the said territories as within the boundaries of any more distant country. So to me, this is fascinating because we often discuss how Lewis does not 
adjust well coming back from the expedition, that things are not easy for York coming back from the expedition. But this gives you a little glimpse into what some of the enlisted men have to deal with, that many of them come home and don't have a lot of money and that they are being offered land grants, which are great, but for some of them, for many of them, if it's somewhere way out beyond where they want to live, it's worthless. Unfortunately, we don't know what became of that petition and whether or not their wishes were honored by Congress. But Bates is very much interested in kind of what happens to these men. He becomes invested and he writes to Lewis as well as Clark mentioning, yeah, some of your, he always says followers, your followers have asked me for help. He's also getting into with all his land deals, he's getting into some trouble. John Smith T, he goes by that because he is one of many John Smiths but he's from Tennessee, so put a T at the end. You can't be too confused with others. He's from a background where he's fairly well educated, originally from Virginia, from Tennessee. He goes west to the Louisiana Territory before it's purchased by the United States and gets land grants from the Spanish, gets rights to lead mine territory and gets a reputation as a rough individual. This guy may not look at it like it, but he is a guy who packed pistols on his hips and threatened people. After the US acquires Louisiana, he gets into more trouble. He is tied up with Aaron Burr's conspiracy. He is involved with Spanish plots, but he's still somewhat popular among many of the Americans who have been living out in Louisiana since before the purchase. When Bates gets there, he's already not impressed. And when he writes to Lewis, Lewis says, yeah, me, Jefferson, we don't want this guy there. He gets important detail to give. He is involved with territorial politics. He's involved with the courts. So he is removed from his position. He's furious. He also has friends who kind of back that up. And it does not help. He's not happy with Governor Lewis, but his beef is stronger with Bates because some of their land deeds are conflicting with each other, especially involving lead mines. So this is just the beginning of issues between the two. Judge J.B. Lucas is out here too. Because of the fact that he is a French emigre who is fluent in multiple languages, including French, and has a legal background and is highly respected, Louisiana seems like a perfect place for him to be, to work as a judge, as well as to be on the land board, helping sort out legal claims. This sounds like it would be great for Frederick Bates. His former mentor is gonna be working somewhat under him in one of the jobs for the land board. Well, things start to get a little harsh. Frederick Bates acquired many of his hardline tendencies from Lucas, but Lucas will cross Bates when it comes to who deserves this land claim, is this one legitimate? And pretty quickly, Bates will be on the bad side of Lucas. Don't worry, in a few years, they'll be friends again. This is the nature of Frederick Bates, whether it's brothers or political allies, he will go through friendships and feuds, then friendships again. Now, Lewis is taking his time to get out here. He was appointed in early 1807, but he's not gonna be there till spring 1808. What's Mr. Lewis up to? Well, he's hanging out in Philadelphia with his friend and intellectual. Mullen Dickerson, and some of that's pretty legitimate. He's working on preparations for the journals because Jefferson, being who he was, believed that putting together a multi-volume set of books on his travels while being governor makes sense. So he's, he is doing some intellectual pursuits, but he's also hanging out with Dickerson and hanging out with women. He's unsuccessfully courting women, but he's trying. 
Among the things that Dickerson includes in his diary about things he does with Lewis, he mentions drinking and shooting at trees. He mentions that they go to a gentleman's house and wait outside his window at night before startling him and then go in to have dinner with this man. They also mention going, they go to a lot of drinking establishments. And at one point he refers to what has been called by people like Ambrose, a ballroom, ball, a bar, barroom brawl. A knife is flashed and a guy's face is cut. Dickerson emphasizes the fact, he says Dwayne's face was cut below the eye. Now that Dwayne, he says, Bodges had a fracas, fracas with Dwayne this evening. Dwayne cut him under the eye. I could never figure out who Bodges was. And I try really hard to figure it out. But the Dwayne in question may have been William J. Dwayne. He's son of a William Dwayne. Both were Irish immigrants who ran the pro-Jefferson newspaper, Aurora. And Dwayne had also been, the younger had been involved with producing the peace medals for the expedition. The cause of the fracas is not specified, but it could easily have been a combination of alcohol and politics. There's a theme here. So some of what Lewis is up to in Philadelphia, taking his time, has some legitimacy, but then there's things like watching a guy possibly get stabbed in the face over alcohol and politics. He's spending a lot of time back in Virginia and looking over some of the land claims for both the Ivy Creek property, Locust Hill, as well as trying to get some of the land claims from his father, William Lewis. He's also hanging out in places like Finn Castle and courting women. In this case, the lady in front of you is Letitia Breckenridge. She is a, contempor she's not even a contemporary. She is a neighbor of Clark's fiance at the moment, Julia Hancock. Breckenridge's are wealthy. They are federalists. And it's one of those things where it's a, almost a quote, legendary moment in Lewis's post expedition life, but we barely know what goes on. It's unclear if he only knew her for a few days and then she bailed out of town to Richmond with her father in the middle of the night, or perhaps he knew her a little bit longer. In any case, Lewis felt devastated by it. And it's one of those things where kind of everyone knew. In fact, George Wallace, who's an army contractor in Indiana, wrote Frederick Bates on December, in December 1807, around the time all of this is happening. What is the matter with your governor? He is rather backward, I suspect, in pressing his suit with a handsome Virginia girl that keeps him. He gave me a hint last spring of his intentions when at Philadelphia. So it's unclear whether Wallace is, when he says Lewis's intentions, whether it's specific to Miss Breckenridge and that perhaps Lewis had met her while stopping in Finn Castle the year before, or if just it's in, meant talking about Lewis's intentions to find a wife in general. In any case, she does not marry Lewis. She marries a cousin-in-law of Frederick Bates, Robert Gamble. Lewis admitted that Robert Gamble had a nice personality. He has nice hair too. I'll let you know that both the painting of Letitia painted about a year after her marriage, Robert done by St. Memon, the year he gets married in 1808. When Lewis gets the news of Letitia's marriage, he's arrived, just arrived in St. Louis. He learns from his and William Clark's mutual friend, William Preston, that Letitia is, as Lewis put it, off the hooks. And he refuses to court her sister, her younger sister, because he, as he puts it, his passion for her sister was such that it would be disgusting to pursue the younger sister. Once again, we don't really know a lot about their courtship. All we know is Lewis apparently was affected by it. And Bates is hearing about it while grumbling, why isn't Lewis here? 
So around the same, so think about this. This is around the same time that Bates gets unwelcome news that Anne Hull has married Mr. Hickman. Lewis finds out Letitia has married Mr. Gamble. So both of these guys are now finally here. Bates is frustrated with Lewis and Lewis is not happy with his the ranch to be a bunch of unhappy, lonely guys. Reuben helps Lewis, Reuben Lewis helps Meriwether Lewis go west and they arrive in St. Louis in March. Now this is where we get into the great realm of Frederick writing to Richard. So at this point, they're friends again, they're brothers, they're all getting along again. And at the end of May, 1807, Frederick tells Richard, I shall write you frequently, but it will not be proper that any extracts of my letters should be published. They will travel back and occasion unpleasant altercation. But as we will see, almost everything that he tells people like Richard to destroy or burn, well, Richard doesn't do that. Hence why we have a great record, which gets us into the realm, the fact that most of what we know of Lewis's governorship and the relationship between Lewis and Bates comes from Frederick's perspective. And it's not a flattering perspective, but it's a biased one, but nonetheless still legitimate as an opinion and a perspective. We have nothing from Lewis's perspective, which is so frustrating. And that it's unclear if perhaps he never wrote anything in the first place because he's a little bit more prudent than Frederick. Perhaps it's that the people he would have wanted to complain to the most, William Clark and Reuben, are right there. Or it may be that his own brothers, whether it be Reuben or John Marks back in Virginia, are a little bit better at destroying his records. In any case, the record of all this is very one sided. So March 24th, affairs are already pretty bad between the two men. Affairs look somewhat squally since the arrival of Governor Lewis. Lewis is reappointing men that Frederick had removed from office. And Lewis is already writing to Clark because he's on the way in June 8, can't wait. My dear friend, I am so engaged at this moment. I hope you will. I hope will pardon my not writing you further by Ensign Pryor, that's Nathaniel Pryor, at this moment. He will give you a description of my present situation and my anxiety to see you. My love to the ladies. So that would be Julia on the way, along with Clark's niece, Anne Anderson. Interestingly, many of their contemporaries, like Alexander McNair, will marry into French families. Lewis obviously doesn't, Bates doesn't. Things are escalating and there are different possible causes. Moses Austin writes to Frederick Bates that he thinks there are malcontents like John Smith T who are trying to create a breach between the governor and secretary, which is said and impressed on the minds of the people has already taken place and that Governor Lewis has expressed his dissatisfaction of the secretary's con conduct. My confidence in the correct views of Governor Lewis are such that until I am convinced by seeing Smith closed, closed with the ensigns of his office, I will not believe him reinstated in the confidence of the governor, although proclaimed by a thousand tongues. So even men who are friends with both Lewis and Bates are being squeezed and individuals like Austin feel like their that enmity is being blown out of proportion and exacerbated by others. During one confrontation, when they're in the office, according to Bates, he tells his brother that Lewis told him to take my own course. And Bates responded, I shall, sir, and shall come in future to the executive office when I have business at it. So they basically decide we're never going to interact with each other in public or interact with each other if it's not related to work. Lewis had hoped, as in Bates even admits, Lewis had hoped that they could at least act cordial in public to get 
people confidence and Bates just thought that was stupid. And Bates was very well aware of the fact that he was a, he became a major source of disturbance and stress for Lewis. And based on what I see in his many letters, he was aware of this enough that he knew he could use this to emotionally corner Lewis. And the fact that individuals immediately after Lewis's death, they don't blame Bates in the sense of thinking he's involved in an assassination, but they essentially think he harassed him to death. So that's interesting. Now there's a ballroom incident that's probably the most famous between these two guys. So the other thing, the only narrative we have of this event is from Bates. So once again, very one-sided. But when there's a there's a ball in St. Louis in January, and Bates is sitting there with some gentlemen, and Lewis comes over and draws his chair over to the table, awkward pause in the conversation, and Bates makes a point to stand up and walk to the opposite side of the room. And as Bates puts it, the dances were now commencing. He also rose evidently in passion and goes into the adjoining room and then sent a servant, probably John Pernier for Clark and already ready to make a challenge. This is embarrassing, everyone saw. But Clark refused to seek Bates out because as Bates puts it, he foresaw that a battle must have been the consequence of our meeting, so a duel. He could not, Lewis felt he could not suffer that kind of contempt to pass, but Clark knew he needed to let Lewis and everyone cool off. This is the great thing about William Clark. He's surrounded, he's sandwiched between two highly dramatic, high-strung men, and he's a diplomat. He thinks this is all ridiculous. So a few weeks later, he goes to Bates, according to Bates, and tries to patch things up. And Bates reports to Richard that he tells Clark, no, the governor has told me to take my own course and I shall step a high and a proud path. He has injured me and he must undo that injury or I shall succeed in fixing the stigma where it ought to rest. You come as my friend, but I cannot separate you from Governor Lewis. You have trod the ups and downs of life with him. And it appears to me that these proposals are made solely for his convenience. So, that's pretty dramatic stuff. And it's interesting because on the one hand, Bates complained that Lewis and his words be had behaved like an overgrown baby expecting leadership in Washington, DC to cater to his every whim. But then on the other hand, this is also in the realm of acting like an overgrown baby. So there's a lot of pomp and just wild honor culture involved with dealings of this day that to our perspective just seem insane. Nothing's better by the spring of 1809 and Frederick tells Richard that he's expressed himself with more freedom to the governor, to Lewis, and they now understand each other much better and that they will try to be more honest and frank with each other, which is better, but they still don't like each other. And Frederick says, I lament the unpopularity of the governor, but he has brought it on himself by harsh and mistaken measures. He is inflexible in error, and the irresistible fiat of the people has, I am fearful, already sealed his condemnation. Burn this and do not speak of it. Well, clearly he, Richard did not burn this because we're looking at it. So once again, good job, Richard. For us, we have a full record. Not a good reputation for Frederick. Already in July, news is getting out that Lewis planned to leave for Washington, D.C., contest bills that have been placed against him by the government, both for the cost for Shehekei's return, for printing the laws of the territory in French, and hopefully trying to put the book together. But there's a lot of problems happening. And as Frederick says, once again, biased, but perhaps with a grain of truth, he, Lewis, has fallen from the public esteem and almost into the public contempt. He's well aware of my increasing popularity 
and has for some time feared that I was at the head of a party whose object it would be to denounce him to the president and procure his dismission. So Frederick knows he's gonna be having to go into acting governor mode again. Lewis is gonna leave pretty soon to go east. William is gonna be going east too. William Clark along with Julia and their son, Meriwether Lewis Clark. Fast forward to the end of September, 1809. James Howe is writing Bates with alarming news that he's receiving in Tennessee. He says, I arrived here two days ago en route from Maryland. Yesterday, Army Major Stoddard arrived from Fort Adams near Chickasaw Bluffs. He was informed that Governor Lewis had arrived there in a state of mental derangement and had made attempts to end his life, which the informant prevented, and that Captain Russell, the commanding officer at the Bluffs, took Lewis in and had to keep a strict watch on him and had his boat unloaded. I hope this account is exaggerated, but fear too much truth in it. So even already, this is one of the earliest accounts we get. It's before Lewis's death, but reports that something is not right with Lewis. And sure enough, he will die October 11th, 1809, likely by his own hand. Frederick Bates's reaction, which we get written to Richard, who also doesn't burn this letter, it's pretty awful. It's not very nice. Frederick tells Richard, you have no doubt, you have heard no doubt of the premature and tragical death of Governor Lewis. Indeed, I had no personal regard for him and a great deal of political contempt. Yet I cannot but lament that after all his toils and dangers, he should die in such a manner. And I won't read all of what he had to say. You've probably seen it before, you can read it, but he basically says, this is what Lewis was gonna get, that he put himself out there to, if you go too high up, it's a long distance down. And hearing that Lewis had taken his own life. But pretty soon, people are looking at Bates. On the arrival of this unhappy news, and before we heard of his death, an honorable gentleman of this place, a colleague of mine at the land board, commenced a regular and systematic traduction of my character. He asserted in several respectable companies that the mental derangement of the governor ought not to be imputed to his political miscarriages, but rather to the barbarous conduct of the secretary, that Mr. Bates had been determined to tear down Governor Lewis at all events with the hope of supplanting him in the executive office with a great deal of scandal, equally false and malicious. Persons who listen most attentively to these accusations happen to be my very intimate friends, Judge Coburn and Dr. Farrar. And kind of, this is sums up Frederick Bates in a nutshell. Richard, this is a strange world in which we live. I have thought my habits were pacific, yet I have had acrimonious differences with almost every person with whom I have been associated with in public business. And the individual involved with the land board saying stuff about Bates, Clement C. Penrose. And he almost gets into a duel with Bates. Claiming that Bates was the self-avowed enemy of the governor, wanted his job. And Bates confronts him after a land board meeting, says, I'll spurn you like a puppy from my path. And Alexander McNair gets involved kind of as a second in between. And Penrose essentially threatens to have Bates arrested for assault if he doesn't leave him alone. So things are going great. There were some people in the world, of course, who felt a little bit more sad about Lewis's death. Anna Bates Jett. Bates is Frederick's sister, said, we heard of the death of Meriwether Lewis about three or four weeks since. He was a particular friend of our brother Tarleton's. Poor, unhappy man, how wretched he must have been. And I lament his death on your account, thinking it might involve your difficulties. William Clark, of course, is ex 
effectively more mournful with his famous quote to Jonathan, I fear, oh, I fear the weight of his mind has overcome him. Pretty early on when Clarkson DC, Washington DC, having to clear things up, he's catching on to a few things. One, no one there was actually too concerned about Lewis doing anything wrong. Two, Bates has been complaining about him. Clark too, nobody really cares. So January 12th, 1810, William Clark tells Jonathan that I have not the good wishes of the animal who I treat like a puppy as he is. And then in July of that year, he says, I am at some loss to determine how to act with this little animal whom I had mistaken as my friend. However, I shall learn a little before I act. He must be very much surprised to find that the government has not taken notice of his information and he tells me they have not answered his letter on that subject. So William Clark definitely does not like Frederick Bates now. He holds him somewhat responsible for what happened to Lewis. And he also finds it hilarious that when he got back from Washington, Frederick Bates shows him copies of the letters he's been sending to DC, complaining about Clark and Clark just says, well, no one really cared, which signifies how even people like Frederick Bates underestimated William Clark at times, but quickly learned Clark has savvy. The fact that he even says, I shall learn a little before I act. Clark is not someone to take lightly. He's a force to be reckoned with. Clark was also offered the governorship and after seeing what and who he would have to deal with, he said, nope. So Kentucky Congressman Benjamin Howard is appointed. He's older than all these other men. They're hoping a little bit more stability will come with maturity. But he was also frequently absent and he pretty quickly, although he pop, becomes popular in the territory because he's just kind of Compared to Lewis and the extremes of Lewis, even Bates and Wilkinson and others before, he's kind of just like oatmeal. He's not too wild. He's just, there's stability with Howard, but he does, he wants out. Like almost anyone in this era, he doesn't really want to be in St. Louis anymore. There's too much infighting. It's crazy. It's not where he wants to live. He misses Kentucky. He also disagreed with Clark on treaties and interactions with the tribes of Missouri. When Lewis had been governor and Clark had negotiated the treaty with the Osage, when the Osage complained that some of the provisions of it were not what they expected, Lewis was okay with letting having some revisions. Howard does not like that. John Smith T is also going to return to the scene. He's still fuming after the past few years. He's not thrilled that he's not an official and that he's on the naughty list of individuals in the territory. Well, Bates, he ignored, he's been trying to ignore him for years, but he shows up. Keep in mind, he's been fighting over tenants, he's fighting over lead mines. John Smith T tries to get his attention and challenges him to a duel, which initially Frederick just kind of goes, oh, who are you again? Why would you issue this to me? This is a surprise. Well, pretty soon after, this is like Christmas Eve, Smith T writes again saying, I saw how you acted when Lewis was not, was on his way here and you thought you had to be in charge and that you weren't even friendly to Lewis. I have professional and personal reasons against you. If you're a real man, you'll accept my challenge for a duel. Well, Frederick Bates thinks that the duels are stupid and he also sees himself as above John Smith T socially. So he does something that's pretty surprising for his era. He just pretends this challenge never happened. He thinks this is stupid and that he's too good for John Smith T, which just leaves John Smith T angry for the rest of his life. The War of 1812 is also coming up. Benjamin Howard uses this as an opportunity to get out of this situation. 
He ends up dying during the war when he's ill. He had not exactly left things in a good position. He and Clark had disagreed on whether or not to have interact with Native American groups to make them allies, to fight the British and kind of to help protect Americans in Louisiana, what's gonna become Missouri territory. So instead during that much of that war, potential allies were out for the Americans, were allies of the British. Bates' old mentor and friend and could have been his father-in-law, Governor Hull is now general in the army. The issue in the War of 1812 is that you have lots of washed up has-beens arguing with each other and a lot of good talent like General Zebulon Pike die in the beginning of the war. It's amazing our country even came out in a stalemate. Hull is most famous in this war for being court-martialed and found guilty of borderline treason because he unnecessarily surrenders Detroit to British General Isaac Brock. And he's lampoon. He's, uh, he is my, my, not censored, he is censored, but He's let go in the sense of he is stricken from army records, but he is he is he is commuted. He does not face the firing squad, but originally he was found guilty for that. Now, shortly after the war, things open up. Similar to Lewis, Bates hoped to get his family moved further west, closer to him, and it's a work in progress. For years. Edward says, okay, I'll help. So this, that's his youngest brother, Edward. In the winter of 1815, 1816, Frederick finally goes home and visits his family and begins forming serious plans. Interestingly, while he's over there, he receives complaints from St. Louis of, when are you getting here? When are you getting here? So he gets a taste of his own medicine. For the next few years, Edward delays getting the family west but James Woodson, one of the other younger brothers, does accompany Frederick back to St. Louis in 1816, and he gets a good start in politics from his brother. Edward finally gets their mother, Caroline, and the others out to Missouri in 1818. That also includes their enslaved household. Although Caroline detested slavery, she still profited from it, but she refused to sell or separate any families who were enslaved. So that's part of what makes their move to Missouri so much longer. Frederick Bates also invites a lot of Gamble cousins and in-laws to come out there. No Robert and Letitia Gamble come out there, but they're going to move to Florida in a few, eventually. This is a photograph. If you've ever followed Lincoln history and read the book Team of Rivals, you might recognize this guy. Edward Bates, of course, this will be him quite a few years from now, but in 1818, Frederick's youngest brother, 25, lost, he has a law degree and he's a War of 1812 veteran. He brings a family to Missouri and that same year, Governor Clark, Clark has become governor since Howard's departure. He appoints Edward Bates as the attorney for Missouri Territory's Northern District. So even though Clark is not a fan of Frederick, he's an animal as far as Clark's concerned, he likes Edward. Edward is social, he's extremely outgoing, he's funny. During the Lincoln administration, Lincoln will refer, will say that he, his hair was still dark, but his beard went gray first because of how much he'd laugh and smile. Definitely not saying say about Frederick. And although Edward often teased Frederick, he still ultimately looked up to him. Their father had passed away when Edward was about 12. So in many ways, Frederick is the closest thing to a father and brother he has. They're, they're trying to get the territory, become a state, it's growing. And there's also some rumblings in politics. William Clark is pretty popular as governor. Julia is a renowned host, hostess, but not everybody agrees. John Heath wrote to Frederick Bates while he was still in DC. I think nine tenths of the territory would agree that we do not want William Clark as governor any longer. Also governor and superintendent should be two men. Although by modern standards, a lot of how William Clark dealt with Native Americans is not great. 
in that time period standard, he was seen as too sympathetic to them. This is the painting of William Clark as governor, painted in 1819 by Chester Harding. Currently, Chester Harding also painted a portrait of Julia to go with this, but we only have the Julia portrait from when she was married, who first got married. In the same era, Frederick Bates is working on his home, Thornhill. This is the house at Faust Park in Chesterfield. And you would think it wouldn't happen, but it does. Frederick Bates gets married. By this point in time, he's in about his early 40s. The famous portrait we always see of him, which I still can't find the artist for, is not painted of him in his 20s or even 30s, so early 30s, but late 30s, early 40s. In 1819, 42 year old Bates married Nancy Opie Ball. She was 17. She'd been born in Lancaster County, Virginia. And she's from another one of those very wealthy Virginia families who moved to Missouri. We don't know how they ended up together, but apparently they were very close. Thomas Maitland Marshall, who did a lot of the editing of the Bates papers in the 1920s, mentioned coming across a lot of wild steaming love letters between the two. I wanna see those. And as weird as it seems today for a 17 year old to absolutely adore her cranky 42 year old husband, times were different. This portrait to the left is Nancy. She will live into her seventies and be photographed. There's no images of her as a young woman. She was very well educated and pedigreed, considered attractive while young. So she pretty much fit Bates's idea of what he wanted for a wife. He just had to wait a couple decades. As a wedding present, he gave her a copy of the poetical works of Matthew Pryor. So they had that shared interest. And in the cover, he wrote Frederick Bates to his friend, wife, Nancy. So she marries a guy who's powerful in the territory, who has a nice house, who has property. And she was the only surviving child in her family and she's immediately adored by Frederick's brothers and sisters and his mother. Shortly after their wedding, her parents moved onward to central Missouri, which was pretty common at the time for people who would farm for a few years, to keep moving on into Missouri. So these are photos from inside Thornhill that I got to take in 2019. I was in the area for the Lewis and Clark annual meeting in St. Louis. Missouri gets its statehood. And to quote Jefferson's reaction to everything, it was like a fire bell in the night. Jefferson had hoped that slavery would just burn itself out. But lo and behold, we get to 1818, 1819, 1820, when Missouri is working towards statehood. And it's not a burned out issue. It's a hot button issue that will divide people. And sure enough, when they go to the drawing board to write the Missouri Constitution and then have it, everything approved by Congress, it's divided very much along pro-slavery or at least slightly pro-slavery lines. Judge Lucas does not believe, for example, that there should be any restrictions on slaveholding status. Frederick Bates is not involved with this. By this point in time, his daughter Emily has been born and there's another child, Lucius Lee on the way. He has no interest in being involved in all of this stuff. But Edward Bates is, and he's getting a lot of advice from Frederick. Edward does not like slavery and eventually he will become an abolitionist, but nonetheless, he does own slaves at this time. And even after he becomes an abolitionist, he still does not view African Americans as equal, which is pretty standard for this time. And the Missouri Compromise, Missouri is a slave state, no more above there. Maine is a free state, broken off from Massachusetts. This is the painting inside the Missouri Capitol. One of the stipulations for statehood was that the Capitol would be moved away 
from St. Louis, which was starting to be viewed as kind of the muckety muck, the establishment capital where people like the Shotos and the Clarks lived. He wanted it somewhere else. So initially it's in St. Charles with the plan to create a whole new capital in the middle of the state at Jefferson City. So this is another painting of Frederick from his lifetime. Now the first governor election, William Clark is running and he, he's running for governor at a time when things are very much changing. It's the beginning of the Jacksonian era. And Clark is viewed as someone who's an establishment candidate. He's a guy who still has his hair long and red. He's also not present a lot because he's frequently back east. His wife, Julia, is dying likely from cancer. This is also an era where while campaigning hasn't quite developed, isn't full out the strategy yet, it's becoming that way. So Alexander McNair goes around and essentially camp almost proto campaigns. And people like Clark view that as tacky and inappropriate. When people ask him about things, he says, talk to people who know me, look at my record. Well, that's not gonna fly anymore in this era. And sure enough, he loses to Alexander McNair, who's the first governor. Frederick Bates in his relationship with slavery is complicated because we don't know a lot about what he thinks. On the one hand, we know that he eventually purchases a family of slaves. He also brags to his mother that he does not believe, he doesn't, as he puts it, he doesn't have to whip his slaves. He feels that he basically leaves them at Thornhill to cultivate stuff without even an overseer. He thinks that physical punishment is unacceptable. And he eventually purchases after his marriage, another family of slaves. And what's interesting is he initially had, one, I'm looking for, I have to flip through my notes, there's so many people. He basically first has one man and then goes and buys his family when he sees them, it appears for sale. So his first family, it's Juno and his family. And then 1820, he purchases and this is the hard part where you, you the idea of purchasing people, but a girl named Lucy, a woman named Sylvia, they appear to be mother and daughter, then Winnie and three daughters under the age of four, and then listed as their father was Benjamin, who already worked, worked quote, meaning was enslaved by Bates. So he's trying to keep families together, which is better, but once again, these are people who have no control over their lives. They may be with people who treat them as well as circumstances could allow in that sense, but it's still not ideal for those individuals. So Frederick does get to become governor. The next election he runs somewhat reluctantly at first. He had already turned down ideas to run for Congress, but he runs against William Ashley for governor who was another flashy frontiersman. Nonetheless, Bates is elected. And for him, he spends a lot of time in his office at home. This is a portrait in the Missouri Capitol building. No matter how you try to take a picture of his governor's portrait, Governors Clark and Governors Lewis will always reflect around him. He is shaded by a mammoth case, a display on mammoths. He's not governor for very long. One of the things he does do is veto a legislative bill to make dueling a whippable offense. He cites his pacifist beliefs and that although his brother had been killed in a duel, he didn't think wh whipping people was any better, any less violent. Also keep in mind that in this, going back to what happened with his brother, who gets whipped? Not Southern, in Southern society, not white gentlemen. Bates knows that he has to uphold at least some level 
of that racial hierarchy. And if you start whipping white Southern gentlemen, that constitutes an alleged breakdown in that model. Another faux pas that happens, faux pas that happens very much that Clark quote saves the day on. Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette is visiting the United States and he's gonna make a stop in St. Louis. And people expect Bates to put on some big to do. And he says, no, thank you. I wanna spend time with my family. He also felt that it was inappropriate to spend money on festive stuff like this when there were injured veterans from the War of 1812. And his quote, he said, if Lafayette were to personally take it into his head to search me up either at St. Charles or on the hills of Bonholm, he would find me at neither place for I've long since promised my family to visit some friends about that time. So Governor Clark ends up being the one to save the day in that regard, along with the Shotos. Many will blast Bates for allegedly having anti-French sentiment involved, but nonetheless, he felt justified in his decision. He isn't governor for very long because he doesn't live much longer. He dies August 4th, 1825, after suffering from pleurisy for a few days. That's essentially the lining around his lungs is stuck to his ribs and he can't breathe. He, when you die from pleurisy, you essentially cough and suffocate to death. And he wrote or dictated his will while dying. And there's some interesting things. He names his wife, Nancy, who's only about, he's, she's only in her early 20s at this point, as his executor. Thornhill is hers for however long she wishes, at which point the property would be divided equally between their children, including the daughter. And he says between the three children and any that came at a reasonable time after his death. He knows that Nancy is pregnant with their fourth and final child. So I've seen accounts that he's buried in Bell Fountain Cemetery, but also a lot that says he was buried before being moved, but most stuff I've seen says he's buried initially and finally at Thornhill. Sure enough, child number four, Frederick Bates Jr. was born February 1st, 1826, six months later. So Nancy goes into a six year widowhood, which is highly unusual for this time. But Frederick leaves her in pretty good financial circumstances and his family takes good care of her and the children. And it appears that she legitimately missed Frederick, which is pretty weird for all of us, but gives us all hope, I guess. In 1832, she married Dr. Robert Ruby and had four more children. And he died in 1839. She lives until March 16, 1877, and is buried next to Frederick at Thornhill. And that's where they are still buried today. It's worth noting that when she marries Robert Ruby, he moves in at Thornhill. And while they apparently had a good relationship, at the end of the day, husband number one was still buried in the backyard. So overlooked legacies, Edward Bates will be on Lincoln's cabinet, first cabinet member who's from west of the Mississippi, though he's technically originally from Virginia. And although he was noted to be very friendly and funny, has a smile. In this photo and many after the Civil War, he does not because although he is with the Union, with Lincoln, one of his sons will fight for the Confederacy. It breaks his heart. Hamilton R. Gamble, who'd been appointed to the courts by Frederick Bates, is also going to go on. And during the Civil War, he will be Missouri's wartime governor for the Union. Missouri very narrowly stops from seceding. He will die in office during that. In any case, Edward Bates and Hamilton Rowan Gamble are, off, are somewhat credited in their own spheres with trying to hold some form of unity in the country. So the lineage in Bates's lineage in Missouri, he still has descendants there. I like that I saw at the Railroad Museum in Kansas City. One of them, one of his grandsons engineer on the Wabash Cannonball. He will have descendants in World War I and World War II, including Marlon Bates, who his story includes essentially buying his way out of a POW situation in Germany 
by promising goods. So this is the family cemetery at Thornhill. His plays in history, he's often remembered as almost like Lewis's evil twin. And sure enough, even now, you go to the state capitol in Missouri, Lewis and Clark have their portraits next to each other. Bates is shoved in this corner behind the mammoths in the shadows. Lewis and Clark have statues all over the place inside and outside the Capitol. Now, why did Lewis and Bates not get along? In my opinion, they both, some of their, they had traits in common, some of which were ones that could not cooperate with each other. So that's Thornhill. Some of the people I want to thank include individuals at the Missouri Historical Society Library, Patty Frick, Jerry Garrett, Mike Venso, individuals from the St. Louis County Parks who let me inside the house when I was there in 2019, and also for preserving it and maintaining it so that when I went in 2021, it looked even better outside. So that's the end. I will stop the share. I have just dropped so much information on you and it went longer than I thought. So congratulations for those who are still here. So suppose I will take questions. Feel free to um, at this point in time, unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you wish um, to ask questions or you can put them in the chat. It is up to you. I'll start. I don't have a question, but I did write some notes that I thought it was an excellent presentation. Well, thank Full you. Of facts, but presented in such a way that I was not overwhelmed and scared and going, oh my gosh, I can't remember all of these. I really enjoyed your presentation and the manner in which you presented it and the little tidbits of humor and um, the foreshadowing of, well, wait, this is more to come. Very, very well done, Shannon. One of the best lectures I've heard. Thank you. Okay, any other, any questions, folks? Yes, uh, I, I don't have any questions, Shannon. Thank you very much. Um, I'd ask you earlier if I could possibly yeah. expand on Tarleton a little bit. Is that okay yeah. if I do that? Um, as Shannon mentioned, uh, Tarleton Bates and uh, Mary Ruther Lewis were good friends. Um, I have an excerpt, a couple of excerpts from some letters that uh, Shannon kind of mentioned, but maybe expand on that a little bit. This particular letter is from Thomas Jefferson to Tarleton Bates, written February 23rd, 1801. Uh, and this is just an excerpt of it. Sir, not knowing where the person to whom the enclosed are directed may be at this time and believing that the that his knowledge may be in Pittsburgh, I have taken the liberty of putting them undercover to you and doing a solicitation that you would be good as to address and forward them to a particular person. So uh, essentially, uh, Thomas Jefferson knew that he could trust Tarleton Bates to pass on a letter to uh, Mary Willow Lewis in, uh, in uh, 1801. And closed in that same packet was a letter to Lewis uh, dated February 23rd, 1801. Sir, the appointment to the presidency of the United States has rendered it necessary for me to have a secretary. So this is the letter, and it's a lot longer than this. This is a letter to uh, Lewis asking him to uh, be his secretary uh, once Jefferson was elected president. Uh, Lewis was not in Pittsburgh at that particular time. Uh, Lewis was uh, still employed as a paymaster for the military. In fact, he had been in Detroit, uh, so maybe he'd run across Frederick, Frederick uh, Bates in Detroit. But he writes to, he, Lewis finally received the letters 
uh, March 10th, he writes to uh, Jefferson, sir, not until too late did I receive your letter of February 23rd. In it, you honored me with your confidence as to express that I would accept your position as private secretary. So again, uh, Jefferson knew that Lewis and Bates were, um, were friends. Um, I, I speculate that Lewis and Fred, or Tarleton Bates first met each other in the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, both were members of the Virginia militia in 1794 that uh, traveled into uh, Western Pennsylvania to put down the rebellion. Uh, Lewis, as we've read in other biographies, liked being in the militia so much that she, he eventually uh, joined the uh, regular uh, army. Bates liked being in that area, <laughs> Western Pennsylvania, in particular uh, in Pittsburgh. So he decided to uh, stay in that area of Pittsburgh and I guess to uh, continue his fortune. There's a couple other cases where uh, it's been mentioned that um, Lewis and Bates were friends and knew each other. Uh, and there's one particular letter where um, Lewis, where Bates mentions that he's kind of disappointed in Lewis because he doesn't write him very often. Mm -hmm. uh, we know it's something that uh, Lewis uh, sometimes did not do. Um, it could have been because uh, Lewis was just not wanting to write or because he was out in uh, the Ohio Territory, Indiana Territory on his job as uh, paymaster. There's another case where it's mentioned that um, Lewis was a friend of uh, Bates. Uh, this is from our uh, foundation's Discovering Lewis and Clark site. It uh, has to do with the air gun incident at Bruno's Island just after Lewis uh, left Pittsburgh. And uh, it mentions that uh, several of the friends of Lewis were at Bruno's Island at that particular time. Uh, it mentions uh, Isaac Craig. The Craigs were important people in Pittsburgh. Henry Baldwin, uh, Shannon mentioned Henry Baldwin earlier. And then he goes ahead and mentions his two closest friends, uh, uh, one of them being Tarleton Bates. So uh, again, they were obviously uh, very good friends. Um, Bates was, uh, Shannon mentioned a Democratic Republican, yeah, uh, I, I agree. I, I sometimes use the term Jeffersonian Republican. Uh, he was very hot-headed and eventually did get into a duel with uh, some of his adversaries in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Shannon mentioned that he used a whip on the guy. I used the term, he beat the crap out of his opponent. So uh, it was not, uh, he was a pretty tough guy, I guess, also. But that eventually led to the duel uh, between uh, Bates. And it wasn't the guy that he beat the crap out of. It was a, it was a second that. Yeah, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even the guy who got whipped. It's some other yeah. <laughs> It was the second that, um, that eventually were involved in the duel. Um, my understanding is that both of them fired twice. Both of them were bad shots and both of them missed the first time. Uh, but the second time, well, they were given in a duel. I guess they were given the chance to uh, apologize to each other. Neither one of them would. So they loaded again. And this time, uh, Bates was shot in the chest and, and died soon after. Uh, again, that sounds like uh, Lewis somewhat. If you remember earlier uh, and, uh, in Greenville, Ohio, treated Greenville, uh, Lewis was challenged to a, a duel uh, over politics again. And uh, fortunately, the commanding officer, Anthony Wayne, would have nothing to do with duels and reassigned uh, Lewis to his uh, chosen company, chosen rifle company, which fortunately was commanded by uh, William Clark. And that was the beginnings of um, Clark and Lewis meeting each other. But back to Bates in Pittsburgh, uh, Bates died in duel. Um, he is buried, he was buried, at, Shannon again mentioned they were Quakers, and my understanding is that Quakers uh, do not wish to have markers uh, where they are buried. So he was buried in an uh, unmarked grave, 
in a cemetery at that particular time it was kind of a rural area uh trinity church now it's right downtown pittsburgh and that's where trinity church is the cemetery is not far from where uh the, the 54th lewis and clark trail heritage foundation annual meeting their uh, uh post hotel is located just a few blocks away uh that at that particular time the whole block was the cemetery uh that's been moved uh, to for urban development and he's in my understanding he's buried somewhere else unmarked so uh, whatever happened in tarleton bates fortunately uh, he was a popular person and it was described that his funeral in pittsburgh was uh, attended the highest number of attendants uh, that did ever known for anybody uh, that had died in Pittsburgh. There is a street in Pittsburgh named Bates Street, uh, and it's the foot of Bates Street is where the dueling down uh, dueling area was located. Uh, Bates had enough sense, I guess, ahead of time to write out his will. Uh, he had he was going to settle in Pittsburgh, even though he had traveled to other places. He was going to settle in Pittsburgh. So he uh, had purchased property. Um, one of his biggest areas, he had purchased property along the Allegheny River, a small parcel, which would have been uh, expensive, I guess. Um, and he purchased a, large, purchased a larger area on what was called Grants Hill. And again, Grants Hill is no longer there. It was, um, it's been leveled to make room for Pittsburgh uh, to develop. Uh, but he uh, evidently, his, his executor uh, was able to pay off all his debts and some of the, what was left over, Shannon, my impression was it was to go to James to further his education. And my understanding is that James Bates was the only one who actually went to college. Is yeah, that, and the, Frederick, <laughs> and even before Tarleton's death, Frederick and Tarleton had kind of been, along with somewhat with Charles Fleming, the oldest brother had made an agreement of, they weren't able to have, get the educations they wanted, but they were gonna to try to help their younger brothers in any way they could. So, so yeah, James yeah, went to go to college. Uh, Edward didn't quite go to college, but still managed to have a better log background than either the older brothers got to have. So it's, I think it's interesting how the older brothers hardly got along except for or at different times, unless you count Frederick and Tarleton but they definitely wanted to take care of their younger brothers. They wanted to see them have a better chance than they did. And because of that, I feel like James and Edward, everything in their lives, like, we're just happy to be here versus Edward versus Frederick, Charles, even at times Tarleton, sometimes they have a tone of, well, we were cheated out of our lives by unforeseen circumstances and we're miserable, we're crabby. So I, I just thought since our annual meeting is gonna be in Pittsburgh, uh, this coming August, and there's a, a, a Tarleton Bates Mary Willow Lewis connection, a real good connection that uh, uh, Shannon has allowed me to uh, introduce that into the program. So thank you, Shannon. Yeah, you're welcome. And a lot of Tarleton's letters, including to Frederick, give us all kinds of insights on Lewis's movements, where he goes, as well as I think, I mean, the fact that he says, yeah, Lewis and I have been talking about things like what's going on with Napoleon in Egypt, like that open, you know, that gives us a good idea of kind of a behind the scenes look of what is Lewis up to, even just hanging around at camp. You know, he's talking about Napoleon, which would have been super big current events at the time in the future of military matters. One more thing, hey, I just now thought about this. I just found the paper, the notes. Um, speaking of friends of uh, Bates and Lewis in, uh, especially uh, Bates in Pittsburgh, another. I think a, a friend of Bates, when Lewis would have known him too, was a man by the name of Henry Marie Brackenridge. Uh, and the reason I brought up that name, it was Brackenridge who in 1811 um, traveled up the Missouri River, wrote a journal of his travels up the Missouri River and met Charbonneau and, um, and uh, Sacagawea. And he's the one that described uh, Sacagawea as a good, a woman of good nature and mild and gentle. Um, so there's another kind of 
Pittsburgh connection to uh, Lewis and Clark. Thank you. We sell his book at my, at my site's museum store. Anyone have any questions, concerns? Anyone gonna yell at me? Cause I wanted to talk about like the least favorite person of Lewis and Clarkia. All right. I just wanna thank you for uh, presenting a good program. You're welcome. I like how I told Sarah, I think it's gonna be like an hour. That was not an hour. I did not keep that to an hour, but that's okay. Yeah. You guys are still here, so I guess it's okay. Okay, I'm gonna leave you. All right, you have a good night. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Yvonne, do you have a question? No, just wanted to say well done. Thank you. Well, thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, see you soon. And you're over in the Missouri, so. Yeah. His All place. right, well, I don't hear any questions, but chat box is just saying how great a presentation that was, and thank you so much. So yes, thank you. Um, again, I appreciate you taking your time, Shannon, to teach us all so many new things. <laughs> You guys are very welcome. Maybe I'll see some of you in Pittsburgh or somewhere else along the trail, maybe in the fort. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. We're going to have the map exhibit this summer. Come see us. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening, no matter where you are in the country. Um, and I will see you all like Shannon said, somewhere along the trail. Have a good one. Have a good night.